We are, um, obviously Monday's a holiday, so there's no quiz on Monday. It'll be on Wednesday. I'll adjust the schedule. It shouldn't um, be that much of a disruption. <clears throat> I don't know why I thought we weren't going to have a holiday, but I just figured with the COVID, they were trying to end classes early. <clears throat> But that only included Thanksgiving. I don't guess it in, involved the Labor Day weekend. Hmm. So we ended the previous chapter talking about uh, periodic properties. Um, and the last two are closely related, um, electron affinity and electronegativity. Um, do you guys remember the main difference between electron affinity and electronegativity? Anyone may answer. Um, is uh, electron affinity with an atom and electron inactivity is with molecule? Typically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so electronegativity is the ability of an atom to draw electron electrons towards itself within a molecule, so it needs to be in the molecule for that to be to happen. Um, but if it is, um, if it has high um, electron affinity, of course, it's going to have high electronegativity. Um, so they are very closely related. I mentioned the three different um, people who have um, come up with different ways to measure electronegativity. Um, and that's either going to be a function of effective nuclear charge or a function of electron affinity. So they use those values in order to calculate the, um, the numbers they assign to the elements based upon um, how much they want those electrons, but we typically use Pauling's numbers. Um, Pauling's the most common and um, fluorine is the most um, electronegative atom um, according to Pauling's rules. It's, it's really odd to me that they would even assign numbers to the noble gases since the noble gases aren't going to want to gain electrons. Typically speaking, we're only talking about <clears throat> the main group and not the noble gases when we describe the trends. Anyhow, at the very end of the chapter, they talk about something that we're, we're gonna be bringing up again later. Um, and this is called polarizability. It's kind of an odd place. So polarizability is um, the ability to distort an electron cloud. Um, you've heard this before. Um, in Gen Chem, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> later on, we're gonna talk about the effects of polarizability. Um, so it's just, it's really easy to understand if it's really big and it's got a lot of electrons, they're easily polarized because they're, you know, many more <clears throat> orders away from the nucleus so they can be distorted more easily. Whereas things that are small, um, are difficult to distort because they're held more tightly to the nucleus. So it does track, um, it does track the um, electronegativity of those elements. But these three bullet points here are also in the notes. I think it's the last slide in those set of notes. Um, small, highly charged cations um, have polarizing ability. Um, that means they can cause something else to be polarized. Um, whereas large, highly charged anions are easily polarized, and cations do not have a noble gas electron configuration are easily polarized. Um, so these are just some rules um, associated with those trends. We will revisit that in a more appropriate place when we talk about something called hard and soft theory. So I'm not gonna include this on your first quiz. This, this is gonna come up again when we talk about um, acid-based chemistry and hard and soft theory. So I will revisit this topic at that time when we go back to that. Okay, so that's chapter one, which is very um, dense. As I mentioned, I warned you about before, there's a lot of information and there's a lot of assumptions of what you've already learned um, in that chapter. So as a recap, we'll go to the table of contents and just look at what's here and what you should focus on in your studies. Okay, so we, we talked about the origin of the elements. And so there's some descriptive things in there that have to do with 
um, the formation of the light elements, the formation of the heavy elements. Um, you have to be able to balance nuclear equations and you have to know how to utilize <clears throat> those subatomic particles that are on the table. Um, so there may be a discussion question in here. It certainly would be um, appropriate. Um, the classification of the elements is just a brief overview. There's no questions on this because it's really inherent in everything. Um, so I would focus mostly on the 1.1 and the 1.2. Um, the classification of the elements, that's going to come up a lot. It's inherent in most everything. So I'm not going to be concerned about those simple things like what's a metal, what's a nonmetal. In terms of the dev development of quantum theory, um, the beginning of that uh, topic is um, relating the spectroscopic information to how they came up with quantum theory. Certainly, you need to be able to utilize the quantum numbers. Uh, you need to know the persons involved in the development of quantum theory and what they're responsible for. Um, for example, if I said the photoelectric effect, um, the person who described that mathematically um, was, um, do you guys remember? He's also responsible for E equals MC squared. Einstein. Hmm? Einstein, thank you. Um, so Einstein, so we have Planck, Einstein, Heisenberg, um, anyone else that you can think of? Who's the wave function? It looks like Seinfeld. Well, Schrodinger. Schrodinger, yeah. So there's a worksheet that I have given students at, at one time or another. I'm going to go ahead and post that. It's just a matching um, for the historical figures. Um, there are a number of ways I can ask a discussion question on there. For example, a duality of light describes both the wave property and the particle property of, um, of a photon. Um, describe the two historical figures that contributed to this theory and explain their contributions. I, that's a simple question based upon those ideas. So that's where students have a hard time, not just writing a definition, but being able to connect those two in a discussion question. So I will give you the, um, I'm gonna write that down before I forget, the matching worksheet to see how well you do yourself, um, test yourself on those historical figures. I know how much you guys like subjective stuff. I'm being facetious right now. Um, certainly the um, quantum numbers, it's something you need to um, practice, what they mean and how to assign them. And then of course the um, discussion of the different orbitals, the L value, the nodes, the um, penetration and shielding in terms of the ordering of the um, energies for those atomic orbitals. And this is being recorded too, so you can always go back and listen to it. I'm not gonna write all of this down. We're just giving a synopsis based on this. So in penetration and shielding, that explains the order of the energies of the orbitals. Of course, we did talk about electron configurations. Um, we calculated the shielding constant and the effective nuclear charge, Slater's rules, so make sure you have that available in your notes. Um, it is open notes for your quizzes and your tests. Um, I'll send you an announcement on Tuesday on how we're going to go about doing the test. It will be with the lockdown browser. For those of you who've done it before, you know exactly how it's going to go. For those of you who haven't, I'll have to explain it to you. We're going to do it the same way we did for general chemistry in the spring. Um, and the summer. So um, the last things that we, we talked about were the atomic parameters, these different trends. Um, in here, atomic and ionic radii, we discussed that, ionization energy, the trend, and the exceptions to the trend. Those are important to be able to discuss. I pointed out some activities within the textbook, which I explained to you um, that you should be able to reproduce for sure. Um, electron affinity, I spent less time on, um, but it is related to the electronegativity. You should know the general trend. 
And then I said we'd revisit this polarizability at another time, even though it's related. It comes up again when we talk about hard and soft theory. All right, so um, chapter two, you should enjoy the beginning because it's lots of review. Um, let's hope that you've mastered some of these in general chemistry. Um, so resonance, formal charge, oxidation states. Oh, I'm sorry. Oxidation states I will not cover um, here. Um, I find that it's a strange place to put it. I'm going to cover that when we do redox. Um, so they put it here because they want to compare the formal charge to oxidation numbers, which are two different things, but students get them confused. So I know why they put them together, but it kind of doesn't make sense. We're taking that out. Um, so resonance, formal charge, hypervalence, that just means having more than an octet. Um, we're not going to be concerned with bond length, bond strength, or bond enthalpies. Um, we're briefly going to touch on the electronegativity and bond enthalpy here, just as it relates to um, the polarity of a bond. But you really do need to know your VESPRA theory, um, which, it, you know, you're going to have a handout or a, something written down, um, which is nice for you. Um, however, you still have to be able to do the correct Lewis dot structure to be able to get the correct shape. Um, so this is um, an important um, background information we're going to build on later. And then after um, you come, after you take the quiz on Friday of next week, we'll begin on uh, valence bond theory and molecular orbital theories. Those are a little bit more difficult for students, but those will be included in the first test. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start review on the um, Lewis dot structures. Okay, and there's a set of notes on here. I just feel more comfortable drawing on the board. This is my board. All right, so if you recall, when you are um, deriving a Lewis dot structure, what you're concerned about is where the bonds are located um, we call the bonds bonding pairs of electrons. So where are the bonding pairs and where are the lone pairs um, in the structure? Uh, what atoms in the center? And how that's arranged. So when you're doing the Lewis dot structure, you're not really concerned about the shape yet. You know, you're simply trying to figure, figure out how everything's put together. Um, the typical bond is considered to be shared between A and B. They've got something similar to this in a figure in the book. Um, so we consider this a covalent bond where um, one of the electrons is thought to come from the first atom and one electron is thought to come from the other atom. Um, but there are bonds where the, and we'll talk more about this later, where two electrons come from one thing and those have a slightly different name, that's a coordinate. Covalent. Can't spell today. coordinates two O's bond. Okay, um, so coordinate covalent bond is just slightly different in a covalent bond, but typically speaking, when we're doing Lewis dot structures, this is more of what we're thinking about, how these pieces fit together. And there's a systematic approach to figuring out Lewis dot structures. Um, there's also some shortcuts, um, and so we'll share both of those. So we'll do the systematic approach first. Um, so we'll do the classic COCl2 as our example. All right, so our job first is to look at the group number in the old system, the AB system. Gosh, what is wrong with me? I can't spell. All right, so we've got the group number in the AB system. That's the number of uh, valence electrons that are going to contribute to the structure. Um, we're going to add those up. And that makes our pool 
of electrons that we are able to utilize. We can't create electrons that don't exist. So carbon is in group four in this example, and oxygen is in group six, and halogens are in group seven, so there's two of them. That would be 14 more. Okay, so this is gonna give us a total to work with of 24 electrons. So that's our pool. So that's the first step is you get that total number of electrons and throughout this process, you're gonna keep track of where those are going. Okay. You can just talk out loud, it's fine. There's a question in the chat feature. I was just asking, um, is there something special about the coordinate covalent bonds? Yes, we... you'll find out later. Okay. It's like a preview of what's coming. Okay, that makes sense. I don't want to get into too much detail. All right, so we have the four, the six, and the um, 14 for a total of uh, 24. All right, so there's 24 to account for. We have to decide um, what atom would go in the middle. So we're gonna put the least electronegative in the center. And then we're gonna connect the other atoms from the outside. Gosh, it's weird today. I don't know why I'm randomly not spelling things right. It's a sign, early sign of Alzheimer's. I might be in trouble. I guess I shouldn't joke about that. Okay, we're gonna um, put the carbon in the center because it's the least electronegative. And then we're gonna connect the other atoms to the center, not to each other. And most of the examples that you get, you have one clear central atom, um, which works out well for this kind of um, strategy. Doesn't work that well for organic molecules. There's a kind of another strategy for that, but this works fine. So as we're assigning those bonds, we're keeping track of the electrons we've used up. And so every time we draw a line, we use two so we had 24, but we just used up six, so that leaves 18, okay? So the next thing that we would do is fulfill the octet for the outside atoms. There's a reason for this, for the outside first. Um, because they are more electronegative. So if you're going to give electrons to something, you're gonna give it to the ones on the outside first. So they're gonna want them more. Okay, so we have to add in pairs. And we're adding six more because the line between them counts as two. And we are looking for the octet. The octet comes from the fact that when we make bonds, we're combining atomic orbitals. So you have an S, PX, a PY, and a PZ. And each of these can hold two. So that's where the octet comes from, eight electrons. Um, they become bonding orbitals, which is the next topic we're gonna be talking about. But that's where the octet rule comes from anyway. So I'm mentioning it here. So we complete the octet, and again, I don't know what is wrong with me. Spelling today. And when we did that, we just took care of six times three, right? So we've used the 18 that we had, and we have no more. Okay, so at this point, we would examine the structure to make sure everything had at least an octet. Um, if we had any more electrons, they would go to the central atom. So we'll write that down. Any additional extra or any extra go to central atom. 
but since we don't have any extra, we don't need to do that step. And then check for octet um, on the central atom. Um, see that it only has three bonds. So this would be the time where you would be concerned with making multiple bonds. If you don't have an octet, and that involves moving um, those um, electrons to make a multiple bond. So instead of having six here, we would have four on the oxygen and we would share that other pair that I just took away. Um, so in this case, we have <clears throat> carbon with four bonds and carbon wants to have four bonds. And we have oxygen with two bonds and uh, two lone pairs, which is the format that oxygen likes to be in. And then our halogens are the way they like to be. So we'll talk about that and why this particular structure is uh, more favorable than, let's say, putting a multiple bond on the chlorine atom. Okay, so that's the general procedure for um, completing uh, Lewis dot structures. Um, and I'll refer you to the general chemistry for more practice. This is really, really review. You've also had this in organic. So I don't, I'm not going to give you like 20 examples. Um, but we will look at what formal charge is and how that can favor one structure over another. So we just did this structure for um, COCl2. That's our structure. And I mentioned that the halogens like this um, arrangement. Carbon likes to have four bonds. Oxygen likes the arrangement up top. Um, the reason for that is something we call formal charge. And we'll just compare the two structures here. Oops. So used to putting oxygen on a double bond, I did that. So why not this structure? So when we do a Lewis dot structure, typically we are representing the most likely structure. So this could happen. There's nothing that says it can't happen, um, but it's not energetically favorable. So it is, it is able to make that bond, but it's not going to be very favorable. So it's a very, very small percentage of a collection of molecules. So this one um, on the left is more stable than the one on the right. So it's the uh, lowest energy structure. Um, and I mentioned that's because of formal charge. So my formal charge formula is the one that I like, which is the group number of the element in question. So you can assign a formal charge to each atom. Group number in the old system minus the sticks which are just the lines that are connected to it, minus the dots, the individual dots that are connected to it. There's a fancier equation, but this works just fine for me. So for example, oxygen is in group six. If I count these two sticks, two single bonds, that's minus two. And then it's got four individual dots. And so its formal charge is zero. That is why oxygen wants to have that configuration. Wherever it's bound, it wants to have two um, bonds to it. It could be two single bonds or a double bond, and it wants to have two lone pairs. And carbon, of course, is carbon, wants to have four bonds. It could have less during some reactions in organic, but those aren't stable that long. Um, perhaps when you have a carbocation, um, I know you've heard those words before, or you will. Have you guys heard of carbocations? Yes. Not yet. You will. Okay, so um, yeah, so if carbon had three bonds, it would actually be positively charged, and that is typically an intermediate in organic chemistry. So there's a, a place for it, but not here. Um, so it's in group number four, and so minus four is zero, so that's why carbon wants to have four bonds. The halogens are in group seven, so we subtract the one stick and the six dots and we get zero. So in this structure, all of the atoms have a formal charge of zero, okay? But on my right, um, oxygen would have a formal, well, I'll let you do it. Um, Kyra, 
Will you tell me what the formal charge of oxygen is in this structure, just to see that you're awake? Uh, it will be negative one. Correct, because it would be group six minus six dots and one line, which is negative one. And that means that this must be plus one because they have to equal zero. And of course, carbon's still zero and this one's still zero. So that is not a preferred structure. So there is a rule or set a set of rules for weighing different structures. It's not always this straightforward. So this you definitely will need to write down, not something we focus on in general chemistry. So the formal charge or formal charges desire zero. Okay, so if you can be zero, it wants to be zero. Okay, that's the first rule. So that was an example where we had one where everything was zero and one where it wasn't. Okay, if you must have a formal charge or formal charges, if you must have formal charges on your molecule, you want the lowest number of formal charges. Number of and value, let me add that. And I'll give you an example of these things. So for example, if you had a plus one and a minus one in a structure similar to what I just showed you, and then you had another option where you had a plus two and a minus two, you wouldn't want the plus two, the minus two, if you, you know, had the opportunity to have a plus one, minus one. And of course, if that was compared to zero, you would prefer zero. But there are cases where you must have a formal charge. Okay, another um, rule of formal charges is that the uh, formal charge uh, negative needs to rest on the most electronegative atom. Okay, so if you had to have a negative formal charge in your structure, if you have a choice, you want it to be on the most electronegative atom. Well, the most electronegative atom is uh, first fluorine and then oxygen. Okay, so typically fluorine or oxygen in the structure are gonna wanna have that formal charge on them. And then chlorine, um, so that's the, those three in the corner, that's the order. Um, and then nitrogen and then sulfur and all that stuff. Um, but this is one you should remember. Okay, so an example, I wrote one down that we were supposed to do. Oh, okay, let's just do the one that's in the book, NO2F. So I want you to give me two alternative structures for NO2F, and you're going to tell me how to write them down. I'm not gonna go through it. You practice, and then tell me what they are. I want two alternative structures where the octet is obeyed in NO2F. Preston, who did you have for general chemistry? Ooh, Preston. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm having audio problems. <laughs> Who'd you have for Gen Chem? For Gen Chem 1? Yeah, well, either one. Um, oh, what was his name? He left. My sophomore year. Bill Cheese? Yes, Bill Cheese. Oh, okay. It's really easier for most of the students who's already who've already had me. They're just used to me. Um, so I feel feel badly for you. But if you got used to Dr. Vilchies, you, you can get used to me. 
He's doing well, by the way. You all know he's. Where is he at? He's in a place in Alabama, not Alabama. In um, you, you did have to ask me that. It's in the South. <laughs> Did he think, go to Georgia Tech? Huh? Did he get like get a new job at Georgia Tech? I think it's no. That's not the name. It's more obscure than that. But yeah, you're right. It is Georgia. It might be Tech. Yeah, you might be right. But he's the Georgia dean. Tech State and Southern. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I need to call him. But yeah, he's doing fine. Anyway, I'm gonna pick on someone. How are we doing, uh, Leah? Aaliyah, what, is, what are my two structures? Describe them for me. So I was working on them um, and I was stuck on the first one because I haven't done formal charging forever. So I was sitting Oh, you don't have to do the formal charges. Just tell me the Lewis dot structure. There's two of them. Um, I know F would be in the middle. I know that for sure. because No, not... that's opposite of what you would do. Um, so the least electronegative goes in the center. So that's N. Yeah. N goes I in the center. Electronegative mixed up. That's what I just realized. Yeah. Yeah, you're just rusty. All right, let me pick on Amaya. Amaya, what do my structures look like? What are my options? Um, well, so I put nitrogen in the center. Mm -hmm. And then I branched off um, kind of like kind of like a triangle, but um, I have I had fluorine at the top and then I had the oxygens at the two bottoms. And then for the fluorine on the first one, I have six, I mean, yeah, six valence electrons, sorry. And then on the first one, I only have one double bond on the left oxygen. And then the other oxygen has six. And so right. then I we're about to have some dogs barking. Sorry. <laughs> Is this what you <laughs> They're very loud. They're upset. Um what was the next thing I did? Um I would I was I stopped there because I needed to I was trying to check to make sure I had all the electrons. All right, so does this look what, like what you had? Yes, ma'am. I just, I stopped because I was going to put another double bond on this other oxygen, but I needed to count my electrons to make sure I had the right amount. That's what I was doing. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know if there's one on the nitrogen or not. I was just going by what you were saying. So, um, so if we start from, from scratch, and again, the dogs are going to bark because my husband's home. <laughs> <sighs> Very distracting. All right, so we've got this configuration. We have the five, we have the seven, and then we have the 12. And so that's 19, that's 24, right? Sounds very similar to what we just did, right? What was the, what was the one we just did? We did C, O, C, L, two, right? Agree? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so it had um, two of the O's and one of the halogens. So it ends up very similar. So we have five and uh, 12, which is uh, 17 and seven, which is 24. Um, and then we put these here and then we have the choice on what to do with the double bond after we figure all this out. So we have 18 and then we have the six. So you do need practice if you haven't done it in a while for sure. But again, we're not doing a ton of practice. So your choice at this point is just exactly the same we did before, right? Agreed? Yes, ma'am. So you have just used 18, so you don't have any left, and then your choice is the multiple bonds. So it's just like before. But in this case, we have a problem because neither one of the structures we're drawing is going to have the preferred um, formal charge, because the nitrogen just does not like to be like that. It's yeah, not preferred. I looking, I was like, I hope I did this right, because I had stopped and I was like, I only have one. I was looking at the nitrogen and then I was looking at the oxygen. So I was like, this looks right. But I was like, I know that oxygen wants to have 
you know, the double bonds. What wants to have a lone pair to have five? Right, right. Well, well, the structures are just messed up in general. So my question is, among these two structures, which is more likely or more uh, stable based on formal charge? So what is the oxidation number of the nitrogen? It is not going to be zero. So what is the nitrogen? It's the same in both structures. What is that? It's plus one, right? Yeah, because it's in group five and then it's got four sticks. Okay. So we're already stuck with plus one on the nitrogen. So our question is, um, which of the structures is more likely given the rest of the formal charges? So in this structure, this is a zero formal charge, right? And this is a zero formal charge, but this one is a negative one formal charge, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then we have um, over here, um, this is going to be negative one. This is going to be negative one. And what would fluorine be? Is it, should it be seven? Would it be positive one? Well, it's group seven, right? Minus two, minus four equals positive one. Okay, so which of these structures is more likely? I, I thought it was the one on the left hand side because it's less formal charges, but I, I don't know. I'm be quiet now. <laughs> no, 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 it's true. Um, but let's pick on someone else. Um, so Aaliyah, so now that we, um, we've figured out what's in the middle, um, the one on the left is more stable, but can you verbalize why in terms of what I just told you in the rules? Because um, it has, it has the lowest number and value of formal charges. So, because you have two of them that have zero formal charge. True. Compared to the one where you don't have any with formal charge, with yeah. a zero formal charge. Yes, absolutely. Overall, it has fewer formal charges. Um, so, um, that is a key element. So, there are, there are questions that you will have to pick the more preferred structure and you will have to explain why. Okay? Make that very clear. There is a, this is actually straight from the book. There's an exercise in the book. Um, a lot of times I just pick on those little exercises in the textbook. So formal charge gives you the more preferred structure according to those little rules that I gave you. Um, and it also allows you to predict structure. Um, so for example, you can skip the Lewis dot steps if you know some rules. So for example, nitrogen um, with a zero formal charge, if it can do this, it will do this. It'll have three bonds and a lone pair. Now those bonds could be any configuration, a double and a single, it could be a triple, um, as long as nitrogen has that. Nitrogen cannot expand its valency because it only has the S orbitals and the P orbitals, and that leaves you with eight. It doesn't have D orbitals. Okay, so also it's small, so it can't fit too many things around itself. And now that seems kind of a silly thing, but it's actually true, it's just geometry. So there's two reasons why something can actually have an expanded valency, okay? So we'll use phosphorus as an example. So phosphorus is in the same group as uh, nitrogen. So certainly it can have the same choices as far as the octet. Um, but phosphorus can also have five bonds. So that's the hypervalence section of the textbook. So hypervalence is just referring to the fact that they can have more than um, an octet. Well, phosphorus is in period three. And in period three, we have also, in addition to the three S and the three Ps, we also have three Ds. There's no such thing as a 2D, right? Um, but we have 3D. So when the orbitals are being made, they're made from the atomic orbitals. And so the more you have, the more um, orbitals you can make. 
Um, so in this case, because of the 3D being available and anything below it on the periodic table, so uh, period four, five, six, any, starting with three, you can begin to have your expanded valency. So that's the first reason. So the first reason it can have a um, expanded valence is because of the availability of the D orbitals, which help you make your bonding orbitals. That's the first reason. The second reason is just size. And just like I said, it's actually, um, some people that argue the size is actually more important. Um, you all know um, when things are um, from organic chemistry, you're gonna be talking about um, things that are crowded. You can't approach a nucleophile when it's crowded. Brandon, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. So if you have these electron pairs that are bonded to something, if the, the center part is too small, they're gonna start having these interactions between the orbitals, they're gonna repel each other. So they just don't wanna be like that if it's too small. So it turns out size is actually pretty important. It really depends on the theorist you're talking to. So those are the two reasons why you can have an expanded valency is a larger size as you go down the periodic table. So geometrically speaking, those orbitals don't repel each other as much. Um, but if they're really small, like in um, period two, they simply can't fit that many things around it. So your expanded valency is going to determine um, your lowest formal charge. So you may have cases where, for example, if I were to do sulfate, sulfate I would have to add two electrons because it's two minus right and if I did the structure for sulfate I might stop here and say everything's just fine um, but I would be wrong because sulfur um, being in group six and the fact that it's in period period three can expand its valency so the most stable structure for sulfur would actually have six bonds like this. And then the formal charges would be on these two oxygens, negative one and negative one, which would be good because that's our charge. Um, and they rest on a very electronegative atom. So that's the um, more stable structure of a sulfate ion because of formal charge. So we have that expanded valency. Okay, so formal charge, expanded valency. Um, so the last thing is your uh, really brief review of Vespra. So Vespra's valence shell, electron pair repulsion, um, so valence shell, electron pair repulsion, what that is saying is simply if there are things bonded to a central atom, those want to be as far apart as possible. So just for the same reason that I mentioned um, when we're talking about hypervalency, um, you, those are gonna naturally spread apart, even if they're lone pairs. Um, so either lone pairs or bonding pairs, they all repel each other. So it can be lone or uh, bonding pairs. Okay, so for Vespra, we have different groups of things. So we have a linear group, which is A represented as AX2. Um, when you have a linear configuration, um, there's two things bound to it. This is the only choice that you have. So typically we ignore that group. Um, you have the AX3 group. So you can have a thing in the center and three things around it or you could have the AX2 with an electron pair and it would adopt the same configuration, only one of these would be a lone pair. But that lone pair needs the same room as the other atoms, okay? Notice in these examples, there are no lone pairs. Um, well, in the starting one, there's no lone pairs on the central atom. So when you start adding E's, 
the E is referring to the lone pair on the central atom that's being replacing the one of the X's. Okay. So that is a possibility. Um, and then we get, so this is group three. So there's two possibilities in group three. And in group four, we have AX4, where the A is in the center, and we've got four things around it. Um, we've got AX3E, where is A in the center, three things around it, and a lone pair. Or we have AX2E2, and we have the thing in the center, two lone pairs, and two bonding. So these are all X's. Okay, so this group has the electron configuration of tetrahedral. So they're all arranged the same way. They're all arranged in a tetrahedral in terms of the electron pairs, but the shape is not that. This is the electron pair geometry. And this electron pair geometry is trigonal planar. Okay, so tetrahedral, trigonal planar, and of course this is linear. Things start to get complicated when you have five. There are lots of choices. So for with the group five, you have AX5 where you have the central atom and you have three on the plane and one on the top and one on the bottom. So if you envision this as being like a triangle and you've got one on the top and the one on the bottom. Okay, so the, this whole group is called trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. Um, and that's because it has two triangle pyramids. If you were to connect these, um, one pointed up and one pointed down. That's where the name comes from. Okay, um, the whole group is called that, the five group. Um, that's its electron pair geometry, but the shapes are not the same as the electron pair geometry. We'll get to the shapes in a minute. But we could have AX4E. Now, when we have um, an electron pair that is not bound to something, it actually needs more space. So it turns out when you're looking at the way that this looks, this lone pair ends up being here where that triangle is, not on the top or bottom. It makes a difference. Okay, so that's AX4E, AX3E2 also makes a difference where those are at. They would rather be on the plane of the molecule than um, on the top or bottom. So it ends up looking something like that. And then of course the last one, which is AX2E3. And in that case, the lone pairs are all on the plane, the one that is described by that triangle. and the X's are on the top and the bottom. And again, the reason the electron pairs are going to be located on the plane of the molecule where this triangle is, is because there's 120 degrees between them. Um, but if it was on the top or the bottom, that's only 90 degrees right here. So that, that would cause it to have more um, repulsion and we don't want that. So they end up arranging themselves to have the least repulsion. Okay, so those are our choices in trigonal bipyramidal. Remember, that's not the shape. Those are the electron pair geometry for that group of five. And then the last one is six. Um, so we start with AX6. And this one has all 90 degree angles. They're all equal. So it doesn't matter where you put the electron pairs. Then we have AX5E.
and then we have a x4 e2 this case it does matter where you put this second electron pair it's going to want to be opposite the first electron pair okay and all of these are in the octahedral Uh, configuration, electron configuration. This is our group of six. We don't do anything over beyond the two electron pairs for the six. Okay, so we're back up a little bit. Let's talk about shape really quickly. Um, if it's the beginning of the group, its shape and electron pair geometry are the same. So this is octahedral. Octahedral, sorry. And that's because it's shaped like an octahedron. It has eight sides um, if you make the triangle on the top and the bottom, the little pyramid. Um, so this is square pyramidal. So it's shaped like a square pyramid. If you were to join these. Pyramidal. And this is square planar. Okay, in the group of five, backing up, I'll leave those there for a second. In the group of five, we have the all five, I'm just gonna draw a triangle. Um, so we have all five things bonded. The group name is the same as the shape. So it's trigonal bipyramidal. Um, if we have one of the atoms replaced, that's a seesaw. So it looks like a seesaw on its side. Um, if we have two of the atoms replaced, it's T-shaped. And if we have um, three of the atoms replaced, it's linear. So the shape and the electron pair geometry are only the same for the first one where there's no pairs, no lone pairs on the structure. For four, the electron pair geometry is tetrahedral. If we have a lone pair, it's trigonal, pyramidal. It's not trigonal planar, trigonal pyramidal because these are at an angle of approximately 109.5 degrees. Um, they're actually a little bit less when you have a lone pair, it kind of pushes them in. So it's somewhat less, more around 107. Um, it's 109.5 exactly if these are all the same atom here, 109.5 degrees. And then if you have two lone pairs, central atom, then that's going to be bent. And so that's our tetrahedral group. Remember, what starts the group is always the same as the electron pair geometry. And then finally, um, we can also have bent with a trigonal planar configuration. I know we're going over a little bit. So trigonal planar is flat. And if we do have a lone pair, it's also called bent. Um, some people call it angular. The angle is different though than the other bent. So the bent coming from the tetrahedral group, the angle is roughly 107, whereas this angle is roughly um, you know, 117, it starts out at 120, but again, it kind of pushes in a little bit when you get a lone pair here, um, causing that to decrease from 120 to uh, a little bit less. But anyway, that's a, a brief review of valence shell electron pair repulsion. Valence shell electron pair repulsion. Electron pair repulsion. Vespra.
Any questions, questions on that quiz. before we go? Um, yes. Okay. Will this be on the quiz? Yes. Okay. Everything that we've done so far will be on the quiz. So if you look at, um, it's not new, so it causes you to have to review it. Okay, so if you're looking at the, um, what we just covered, we did the octet. Um, I didn't discuss resonance. We'll go back and discuss that, so I won't put resonance on the uh, quiz. But we certainly did the formal charge, hypervalence. Um, we've discussed those two things, and we reviewed just basic Lewis dot structures. Um, we've talked about the Vespra model, the basic shapes, and the modifications are the, just the shapes that I discussed. So review on those. I'll go ahead and make that general chemistry available to you. This, none of this we've actually talked about is um, new. It's all general chemistry level. Um, we will talk about new things in this chapter, but that's not one of them. So yeah, you're going to need to review that, but you have a long weekend and um, probably end up taking one, one day off just like me and the rest of the day you're going to be working. So try to make sure that you organize your notes and understand it. Well, luckily it's open notes. So um, it will be timed though during class time. So it will be, there will be a limit on the time. So it's okay to have notes, but if you have to be looking everything up, it's going to take a long time. Anyway, I will be around on Monday if you have any questions, but um, since it's not until Wednesday, probably Tuesday during office hours would be the best time. Um, I can also make appointments uh, Tuesday in the morning. I don't have anything before 1230. All right, my dears. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Thank you. We're off Monday, right? Awesome. Yeah, you're off Monday. Your quiz is Wednesday. <laughs> My bad. Labor Day. Uh, or Memorial Day, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever the day is. The extra day. Yes. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye, everyone. Enjoy y'all weekend. Have a good weekend.